This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. Translated by H. R. James. Book 3, True Happiness and False. Section 5 and Song 5. Self-Mastery. Well, then. Does sovereignty and the intimacy of kings prove able to confer power? Why, surely does not the happiness of kings endure forever? And yet antiquity is full of examples, and these days also, of kings whose happiness has turned into calamity. How glorious a power which is not even found effectual for its own preservation! But if happiness has its source in sovereign power, is not happiness diminished and misery inflicted in its stead, in so far as that power falls short of completeness? Yet, however widely human sovereignty be extended, there must still be more peoples left, over whom each several king holds no sway. Now, at whatever point the power on which happiness depends ceases, here powerlessness steals in and makes wretchedness. So, by this way of reckoning, there must needs be a balance of wretchedness in the lot of the king. The tyrant who had made trial of the perils of his condition figured the fears that haunt the throne under the image of a sword hanging over a man's head. What sort of power, then, is this which cannot drive away the gnawings of anxiety or shun the stings of terror? Fain would they themselves have lived secure, but they cannot. Then they boast about their power. Dost thou count him to possess power whom thou seest to wish what he cannot bring to pass? Dost thou count him to possess power whom encompasses himself with a bodyguard, who fears those he terrifies more than they fear him, who, to keep up the semblance of power, is himself at the mercy of his slaves? Need I say anything of the friends of kings, when I show royal dominion itself utterly miserable and weak? Why, oft times the royal power in its plenitude brings them low, oft times involves them in its fall. Nero drove his friend and preceptor Seneca to the choice of the manner of his death. Antoninus exposed Papinianus, who was long powerful at court, to the swords of the soldiery. Yet each of these was willing to renounce his power. Seneca tried to surrender his wealth also to Nero, and go into retirement, but neither achieved his purpose. When they tottered, their very greatness dragged them down. What manner of a thing, then, is this power which keeps men in fear while they possess it, which when thou art fain to keep it, thou art not safe, and when thou desirest to lay it aside, thou canst not rid thyself of. Are friends any protection who have been attached by fortune, not by virtue? Nay, him who good fortune has made a friend, ill fortune will make an enemy. And what plague is more effectual to do hurt than a foe of one's own household? Who on power sets his aim, first must his own spirit tame. He must shun his neck to thrust, neath the unholy yoke of lust. For though India's far-off land, Bow before his wide command, at most Thule homage pay, if he cannot drive away, the haunting care and black distress, in his power he's powerless. End of Book 3, True Happiness and False, Section 5 and Song 5, Self-Mastery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius Translated by H. R. James Book 3, True Happiness and False Section 6 and Song 6, True Nobility Again how misleading, how base a thing oft times glory is! Well does the tragic poet claim, O oh, fond repute, how many a time and oft hast them raised high the base-born churl! For many have won a great name through the mistaken belief of the multitude, and what can be imagined more shameful than that? Nay, they who are praised falsely must needs themselves blush at their own praises, and even when praise is won by merit, still, how does it add to the good conscience of the wise man who measures his good not by popular repute, but by the truth of inner conviction? And if at all it does seem a fair thing to get this same renown spread abroad, it follows that any failure so to spread it is held foul. But if, as I set forth but now, 
there must needs be many tribes and people whom the fame of any single man cannot reach. It follows that he whom thou esteemest glorious seems all inglorious in a neighboring quarter of the globe. As to popular favor, I do not think it worthy of mentioning in this place, since it never cometh of judgment and never lasteth steadily. Then again, who does not see how empty, how foolish is the fame of noble birth? Why, if the nobility is based on renown, the renown is another's. For truly, nobility seems to be a sort of reputation coming from the merits of ancestors. But if it is the praise which brings renown, of necessity it is they who are praised that are famous. Wherefore, the fame of another clothes thee not with splendor, if thou hast none of thine own. So if there is any excellence in nobility of birth, methinks it is this alone, that it would seem to impose upon the nobly born the obligation not to degenerate from the virtue of their ancestors. All men are of kindred stock, though scattered far and wide. For one is father of us all, one doth for all provide. He gave the sun his golden beams, the moon her silver horn. He set mankind upon the earth as stars the heavens adorn. He shut a soul, a heavenly born soul, within the body's frame. The noble origins he gave each mortal weight may claim. Why boast ye then, so loud, of race and high ancestral line, if ye behold your being's source and God's supreme design? None is degenerate, none base, unless by taint of sin. And cherished vice he foully stains his heavenly origin. End of Book 3 True Happiness and False Section 6 and Song 6 True Nobility LibriVox Recording All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Botius Translated by H. R. James Book 3 True Happiness and False Song 7 Pleasure's Sting and Section 7 7. Then what shall I say of the pleasures of the body? The lust thereof is full of uneasiness, the sating of repentance. What sickness, what intolerable pains, are they wont to bring on the bodies of those who enjoy them, the fruits of iniquity, as it were? Now what sweetness the stimulus of pleasure may have, I do not know. But that the issues of pleasure are painful, every one may understand who chooses to recall the memory of his own fleshly lusts. Nay, if these can make happiness, there is no reason why the beasts also should not be happy, since all their efforts are eagerly set upon satisfying the bodily wants. I know, indeed, that the sweetness of wife and children should be right comely, yet only too true to nature is what was said of one that he found in his sons his tormentors. And how galling such a contingency would be! I must needs put thee in mind since thou hast never in any wise suffered such experiences, nor art there now under any uneasiness. In such a case, I agree with my servant Euripides, who said that a man without children was fortunate in his misfortune. Song 7. Pleasure Sting This is the way of pleasure. She stings them that despoil her, and like the winged toiler, who's lost her honeyed treasure, she flies, but leaves her smart, deep rankling in the heart. End of Book 3, True Happiness and False, Song 7, Pleasure Sting, and Section 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Botius Translated by H. R. James Book 3, True Happiness and False Song 8, Human Folly, and Section 8 
8. It is beyond doubt, then, that these paths do not lead to happiness. They cannot guide any one to the promised goal. Now I will very briefly show what serious evils are involved in following them. Just consider, is it thy endeavor to heap up money? Why, thou must wrest it from its present possessor. Art thou minded to put on the splendor of official dignity? Thou must beg from those who have the giving of it. Thou who covetest to outvie others in honor, must lower thyself to the humble posture of petition. Dost thou long for power? Thou must face perils, for thou wilt be at the mercy of thy subjects' plots. Is glory thy aim? Thou art lured on through all manner of hardships, and there is an end to thy peace of mind. Art fain to lead a life of pleasure? Yet who does not scorn and condemn one who is the slave of the weakest and vilest of things, the body? Again, on how slight and perishable a possession do they rely who set before themselves bodily excellences? Can ye ever surpass the elephant in bulk or the bull in strength? Can ye excel the tiger in swiftness? Look upon the infinitude, the solidity, the swift motion of the heavens, and for once cease to admire things mean and worthless. And yet the heavens are not so much to be admired on this account as for the reason which guides them. Then how transient is the luster of beauty, how soon gone, more fleeting than the fading bloom of spring flowers. And yet if, as Aristotle says, men should see with the eyes of Lincius, so that their sight might pierce their obstructions, would not that body of Alcibiades, so gloriously fair in outward seeming, appear altogether loathsome when all its inward parts lay open to the view? Therefore, it is not thy own nature which makes thee seem beautiful, but the weakness of the eyes that see thee. Yet prize as unduly as ye will that body's excellences, so long as ye know that this that ye admire, whatever its worth, can be dissolved away by the feeble flame of a three days' fever. From all which considerations we may conclude as a whole, that these things which cannot make good the advantages they promise, which are never made perfect by the assemblage of all good things, these neither lead as byways to happiness, nor themselves make men completely happy. Song 8. Human Folly Alas, how wide astray doth ignorance these wretched mortals lead from truth's own way! For not on leafy stems do ye within the green wood look for gold, nor strip the vine for gems. Your nets ye do not spread upon the hilltops that the groaning board with fish be furnished. If ye are fain to chase the bounding goat, ye sweep not in vain, search the ocean's ruffled face. The sea's far depths they know, each hidden nook wherein the waves o'erwash, the pearl as white as snow, where lurks the Tyrian shell, where fish and prickly urchins do abound. All this they know full well. But not to know or care, where hidden lies the good all hearts desire, this blindness they can bear. With gaze on earth low bent, they seek for that which reacheth far beyond the starry firmament. What curse shall I call down on hearts so dull? May the race still run for wealth and high renown. And when with much ado, the false good they have grasped, ah, then too late may they discern the true. End of Book 3 True Happiness and False Song 8 Human Folly and Section 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cyril Law, Jr. The Consolation of Philosophy 
pa Anicius Manlius Severinus Boetius. Translated by H. R. James. Book Three, True Happiness and Force, Section Nine and Song Nine, Invocation. This much may well suffice to set forth the form of false happiness. If this is now clear to thine eyes, the next step is to show what true happiness is. Indeed, said I, I see clearly enough that neither is independence to be found in wealth, nor power in sovereignty, nor reference in dignities, nor fame in glory, nor true joy in pleasures. Hast thou discerned then also the causes why this is so? I seem to have some inkling, but I should like to learn more at large from thee. Why, truly the reason is hard at hand. That which is simple and indivisible by nature, human error separates, and transforms from the true and perfect to the false and imperfect. Dost thou imagine that which lacketh nothing can want power? C certainly not, right? For if there is any feebleness of strength in anything, in this there must necessarily be need of external protection. That is so. Accordingly, the nature of independence and power is one and the same. It seems so. Well, but does it think that anything of such a nature as this can be looked upon with contempt? Or is it rather of all things most worthy of veneration? Nay, there can be no doubt as to that. Let us then add reverence to independence and power. And conclude these three to be one. We must, if we will acknowledge the truth, thinkest thou then this combination of qualities to be obscure and without distinction, or rather famous in all renown? Just consider, can that want renown which has been agreed to be lacking in nothing, to be supreme in power and right worthy of honour? For the reason that it cannot bestow this upon itself, and so comes to appear somewhat poor in esteem, I cannot but acknowledge that, being what it is, this union of qualities is also right famous. It follows then that we must admit that renown is not different from the other three. It does, said I. That then, which needs nothing outside itself. Which can accomplish all things in its own strength, which enjoys fame and compels reference, must not this evidently be also fully crowned with joy? In sooth, I cannot conceive, said I, how any sadness can find entrance into such a state. Wherefore, I must needs acknowledge it full of joy, at least if our former conclusions are to hold. Then, for the same reasons, this also is necessary, that independence, power, renown, reverence, and sweetness of delight are different only in name, but in substance differ no wise one from the other. It is, said I, this then which is one and simple by nature, human perversity separates, and in trying to win a part of that which has no parts. Fails to attain not only that portions, since there are no portions, but also the whole, to which it does not dream of aspiring. How so? said I. He who, to escape one, seeks riches, gives himself no concern about power. He prefers a mean and low estate, and also denies himself many pleasures dear to nature to avoid losing the money which he has gained. But at this rate, he does not even attain to independence. A weakling, void of strength, vexed by distresses, mean and despised, and buried in obscurity. He again, who thirsts alone for power, squanders his wealth, despises pleasures, and thinks fame and rank alike worthless without power. But thou seest in how many ways his state also is defective. 
Sometimes it happens that he lacks necessaries, that he is gnawed by anxieties, and since he cannot rid himself of these inconveniences, even ceases to have that power which was his whole end and aim. In like manner, may we cast up the reckoning in case of rank, of glory, or of pleasure. For since each one of these severally is identical with the rest, whosoever seeks any one of them without the others does not even lay hold of that one which he makes his aim. Well, said I, what then? Suppose anyone desire to obtain them together, he does indeed wish for happiness as a whole. But will he find it in these things, which, as we have proved, are unable to bestow what they promise? Nay, by no means, said I. Then happiness must certainly not be sought in these things, which severally are believed to afford some one of the blessings most to be desired. They must not, I admit, no conclusion could be more true. So then, the form and the causes of false happiness are set before thine eyes. Now turn thy gaze to the other side. There thou wilt straightway see the true happiness I promised. Yes, indeed, this pain to the blind, said I. Thou dost point it out even now in seeking to unfold the courses of the force. For, unless I am mistaken, that is true and perfect happiness which crowns one with the union of independence, power, reverence, renown, and joy. And to prove to thee with how deep an insight I have listened, since all these are the same, that which can truly bestow one of them I know to be without doubt full and complete happiness. Happy art thou, my scholar, in this thy conviction. Only one thing shouldst thou add. What is that? said I. Is there aught, thinkest thou, amid these mortal and perishable things which can produce a state such as this? Nay, surely not, and this thou hast so amply demonstrated that no word more is needed. Well then, these things seem to give to mortals shadows of the true good, or some kind of imperfect good. But the true and perfect good they cannot bestow. Even so, said I, since then thou hast learned what that true happiness is, and what men falsely call happiness. It now remains that thou shouldst learn from what source to seek this. Yes, to this I have long been eagerly looking for. Well, since, as Plato maintains in the Timaeus, we ought even in the most trivial matters to implore the divine prote protection. What thinkest thou should we now do in order to deserve to find a seat of that highest good? We must invoke the Father of all things, said I for without this no enterprise sets out from a right beginning. Thou sayest well, Shets, said she, and forthwith lifted up her voice and sang Song 9, Invocation. Maker of earth and sky from age to age, who rulest the world by reason, at whose word time issues from eternity's abyss. To all that moves the source of movement, fix thyself and moveless. Thee no course impelled, extrinsic this proportion frame to shape from shapeless matter. But deep sat within thy inmost being, the form of perfect good from envy free, and thou this mould the whole to that supernal pattern, Beauteous the world in thee thus imaged, being thyself most beautiful. So thou the work didst fashion in that fair likeness, bidding it put on perfection through the exquisite perfectness of every part's contrivance. Thou dost bind the elements in balanced harmony, so that the hot and cold, the moist and dry, 
contend not, nor the pure fire leaping up escape, or weight of waters whelm the earth. Thou joinest and diffusest through the whole, linking accordantly its several parts, a soul of threefold nature moving all. This cleft in twain, and in two circles gathered, speeds in a path that on itself returns, encompassing mind's limits, and conforms the heavens to her true semblance. Lesser souls and lesser lives by a like ordinance thou sendest forth, each to its starry car affixing, and dost strew them far and wide over earth and heaven. These by a law benign thou biddest turn again, and render back to thee their fires. O grant, almighty Father, grant us on reason's wing to soar aloft to heaven's exalted height. Grant us to see the fount of good. Grant us the true light found, to fix our steadfast eyes in vision clear on thee. Disperse the heavy mists of earth, and shine in thine own splendour, for thou art the true serenity and perfect rest of every pious soul. To see thy face, the end and the beginning, one the guide, the traveller, the pathway and the goal. End of section 9「A Libri Fox Recording」All Libri Vox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cyril Law, Jr. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Boetius Translated by H. R. James Book 3. True Happiness and Force Section 10 and Song 10, The True Light Since now thou hast seen what is the form of the imperfect good, and what the form of the perfect also, methinks I should next show in what manner this perfection of felicity is built up. And here I conceive it proper to inquire, first, whether any excellence, such as thou hast lately defined, can exist in the nature of things, lest we be deceived by an empty fiction of thought to which no true reality answers. But it cannot be denied that such does exist, and is, as it were, the source of all things good. For everything which is called imperfect is spoken of as imperfect by reason of the privation of some perfection. So it comes to pass that whenever imperfection is found in any particular, there must necessarily be a perfection in respect of that particular also. For were there no such perfection, it is utterly inconceivable how that so-called imperfection should come into existence. Nature does not make a beginning with things mutilated and imperfect. She starts with what is whole and perfect, and falls away later through these feeble and inferior productions. So if there is, as we showed before, a happiness of a frail and imperfect kind, it cannot be doubted that there is also a happiness substantial and perfect. Most true is thy conclusion, and most sure, said I. Next, to consider where the dwelling place of this happiness may be. The common belief of all mankind agrees that God, the supreme of all things, is good, for since nothing can be imagined better than God, how can we doubt Him to be good than whom there is nothing better? Now, reason shows God to be good in such wise as to prove that in Him is perfect good. For were it not so, He would not be supreme of all things. For there would be something else more excellent 
possessed of perfect good, which would seem to have the advantage in priority and dignity, since it has clearly appeared that all perfect things are prior to those less complete. Wherefore, lest we fall into an infinite regression, we must acknowledge the supreme God to be full of supreme and perfect good. But we have determined that true happiness is the perfect good. Therefore, true happiness must dwell in the supreme deity. I accept thy reasonings, said I. They cannot in any wise be disputed. But, come, see how strictly and incontrovertibly thou mayest prove this our assertion, that the supreme God hath fullest possession of the highest good. In what way, pray, said I, do not rashly suppose that he who is the father of all things hath received that highest good, of which he is said to be possessed, either from some external source, or hath it as a natural endowment in such sort that thou mightest consider the essence of the happiness possessed, and of the God who possesses it, distinct and different. For if thou deemest it received from without, thou mayest esteem that which gives more excellent than that which has received. But him we most worthily acknowledge to be the most supremely excellent of all things. If, however, it is in him by nature, yet is logically distinct, the thought is inconceivable, since we are speaking of God, who is supreme of all things. Who was there to join these distinct essences? Finally, when one thing is different from another, the things so conceived as distinct cannot be identical. Therefore, that which of its own nature is distinct from the highest good is not itself the highest good. An impious thought of him than whom this plain nothing can be more excellent. For universally nothing can be better in nature than the source from which it has come. Therefore, on most true grounds of reason would I conclude that which is the source of all things to be, in its own essence, the highest good. And most justly, said I, but the highest good has been admitted to be happiness. Yes. Then, said she, it is necessary to acknowledge that God is very happiness. Yes, said I, I cannot gainsay my former admissions, and I see clearly that this is a necessary inference therefrom. Reflect also, said she, whether the same conclusion is not further confirmed, by considering that there cannot be two supreme goods distinct one from the other. For the goods which are different clearly cannot be severally each what the other is. Wherefore neither of the two can be perfect, since to either the other is wanting. But since it is not perfect, it cannot manifestly be the supreme good. By no means, then, can goods which are supreme be different one from the other. But we have concluded that both happiness and God are the supreme good. Wherefore that which is highest divinity must also itself necessarily be supreme happiness. No conclusion, said I, could be truer to fact, nor more soundly reasoned out, nor more worthy of God. Then, further, said she, just as geometricians are wont to draw inferences from their demonstrations to which they give the name deductions, so will I add here a sort of corollary. For since men become happy by the acquisition of happiness, while happiness is a very godship, it is manifest that they become happy by the acquisition of godship. But as by the acquisition of justice men become just, and wise by the acquisition of wisdom, so by parity of reasoning, by acquiring godship, they must of necessity become gods. So every man who is happy is a god. And though in nature God is one only, yet there is nothing to hinder that very many should be gods by participation in that nature. A fair conclusion, and a precious, said I, deduction or corollary, by whichever name thou wilt call it. And yet, said she, 
not one whit fairer than this which reason persuades us to add. Why? What? said I. Why? Seeing happiness has many particulars included under it, should all these be regarded as forming one body of happiness, as it were, made up of various parts, or is there some one of them which forms the full essence of happiness, while all the rest are relative to this? I would thou wouldst unfold the whole matter to me at large. We judge happiness to be good, do we not? Yeah, the supreme good, and this superlative applies to all. For this same happiness is adjudged to be the completest independence, the highest power, reverence, renown, and pleasure. What then? Are all these goods, independence, power, and the rest, to be deemed members of happiness, as it were, or are they all relative to good as to their summit and crown? I understand the problem, but I desire to hear how thou wouldst solve it. Well then, listen to the determination of the matter. Were all these members composing happiness, they would differ severally one from the other. For this is the nature of parts, that by their difference they compose one body. All these, however, have been proved to be the same, therefore they cannot possibly be members. Otherwise, happiness will seem to be built up out of one member, which cannot be. There can be no doubt as to that, said I, but I am impatient to hear what remains. Why? It is manifest that all the others are relative to the good. For the very reason why independence is sought is that it is judged good, and so power also, because it is believed to be good. The same, too, may be supposed of reference, of renown, and of pleasant delight. Good, then, is the sum and source of all desirable things. That which has not in itself any good, either in reality or in semblance, can in no wise be desired. Contrarywise, even things which by nature are not good are desired, as if they were truly good, if they seem to be so whereby it comes to pass that goodness is rightly believed to be the sum and hinge and cause of all things desirable. Now, that for the sake of which anything is desired itself seems to be most wished for. For instance, if any one wishes to ride for the sake of health, he does not so much wish for the exercise of riding as the benefit of his health. Since then all things are sought for the sake of the good, it is not these so much as good itself that is sought by all. But that on account of which all other things are wished for was, we agreed, happiness. Wherefore, thus also it appears that it is happiness alone which is sought. From all which it is transparently clear that the essence of absolute good and of happiness is one and the same. I cannot see how anyone can dissent from these conclusions. But we have all proved that God and true happiness are one and the same. Yes, said I, then we can safely conclude also that God's essence is seated in absolute good and nowhere else. Song 10 The True Light Hither come, all ye whose minds lust with rosy fetters binds, lust to bondage heart compelling the earthly souls that are his dwelling. Here shall be your labours close, here your haven of repose. Come to your one refuge press, wide it stands to all distress. Not the glint of yellow gold down bright Hermus's current road, not the tagus precious stands, nor in far-off scorching lands all the radiant gems that hide under Indus's storied tide. Emerald green and glistering white can illume our feeble sight. But they rather leave the mine in its native darkness blind. For the fairest beams they shed in earth's lowest depths were fed, 
but the splendor that supplies strength and vigor to the skies and the universe controls shunneth dark and ruined souls he who once hath seen this light will not call the sunbeam bright end of book three section ten and song ten the true light This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anicius Manlius Severinus Bothius. Translated by H. R. James. Book 3 Reminiscence. Song 11, Section 27. I quite agree, said I. Truly all thy reasonings hold admirably together. Then said she, What value wouldst thou put upon the boon, shouldst thou come to the knowledge of the absolute good? Oh, an infinite, said I, if only I were so blessed as to learn to know God also who is the good. Yet this will I make clear to thee on truest grounds of reason, if only our recent conclusions stand fast. They will. Have we not shown that those things which most men desire are not true and perfect good precisely for this cause, that they differ severally one from another, and, seeing that one is wanting to another, they cannot bestow full and absolute good, but that they become the true good when they are gathered, as it were, into one form and agency, so that that which is independence is likewise power, reverence, renown, and pleasant delight? And unless they are all one and the same, they have no claim to be counted among the things desirable. Yes, this was clearly proved, and cannot in any wise be doubted. Now, when things are far from being good while they are different, but become good as soon as they are one, is it not true that these become good by acquiring unity? It seems so, said I. But dost not thou allow that all which is good is good by participation and goodness? It is. Then thou must on similar grounds admit that unity and goodness are the same. For when the effects of things in their natural workings differ not, their essence is one and the same. There is no denying it. Now dost thou know, said she, that all which is abides and subsists so long as it continues one, but so soon as it ceases to be one, it perishes and falls to pieces. In what way? Why take animals, for example? When body and soul come together and continue in one, this is, we say, a living creature. But when this unity is broken by the separation of these two, the creature dies and is clearly no longer living. The body also, while it remains in one form by joining together of its members, presents a human appearance. But if the separation and dispersal of the parts break up the body's unity, it ceases to be what it was. And if we extend our survey to all other things, without doubt it will manifestly appear that each several thing subsists while it is one, but when it ceases to be one, perishes. Yes, when I consider further, I see that it is to be even as thou sayest. Well, is there aught, said she, which, in so far as it acts conformably to nature, abandons the wish for life, and desires to come to death and corruption? Look to living creatures which have some faults of choice. I find none that, without external compulsion, forego the will to live, and of their own accord hasten to destruction. For every creature diligently pursues the end of self-preservation, and shuns death and destruction, as to herbs and trees, and inanimate things, generally, I am altogether in doubt what to think. And yet there is no possibility of question about this either, since thou seest how herbs and trees grow in places suitable for them, where, as far as their nature admits, they cannot quickly wither and die. Some spring up in the plains, others in the mountains, some grow in marshes, others cling to rocks, and others, again, find a fertile soil in the barren sands. 
and if you try to transplant these elsewhere, they wither away. Nature gives to each the soil that suits it, and uses her diligence to prevent any of them dying, so long as it is possible for them to continue alive. Why do they all draw their nourishment from roots, as from a mouth dipped into the earth, and distribute the strong bark over the pith? Why are all the softer parts like the pith deeply encased within, while the external parts have the strong texture of wood, and outside of all is the bark to resist the weather's inclemency, like a champion stout in endurance? Again, how great is nature's diligence to secure universal propagation by multiplying seed? Who does not know all these to be contrivances? not only for the present maintenance of a species, but for its lasting continuance, generation after generation, forever. And do not also the things believed inanimate on like grounds of reason seek each what is proper to itself? Why do the flames shoot lightly upward, while the earth presses downward with its weight? If it is not that these motions and situations are suitable to their respective natures. Moreover, each several thing is preserved by that which is agreeable to its nature, even as it is destroyed by things inimical. Things solid like stones resist disintegration by the close adhesion of their parts. Things fluid like air and water yield easily to what divides them, but swiftly flow back and mingle with those parts from which they have been severed, while fire, again, refuses to be cut at all. And we are not now treating of the voluntary motions of an intelligent soul, but of the drift of nature. Even so it is that we digest our food without thinking about it, and draw our breath unconsciously in sleep. Nay, even in living creatures the love of life cometh not of conscious will, but of the principles of nature. For oftentimes, in the stress of circumstances, will chooses the death, which nature shrinks from. And contrarily, in spite of natural appetite, will restrains that work of reproduction by which alone the persistence of perishable creatures is maintained. So entirely does this love of self come from drift of nature, not from animal impulse. Providence has furnished things with this most cogent reason for continuance. They must desire life, so long as it is naturally possible for them to continue living. Wherefore, in no way mayest thou doubt, but that things naturally aim at continuance of existence, and shun destruction. I confess, said I, that what I lately thought uncertain, I now perceive to be indubitably clear. Now that which seeks to subsist and continue desires to be one. For if its oneness be gone, its very existence cannot continue. True, said I, all things, then, desire to be one. I agree. But we have proved that one is the very same thing as good. We have. All things, then, seek the good. Indeed, you may express the fact by defining good as that which all desire. Nothing could be more truly thought out. Either there is no single end to which all things are relative, or else the end to which all things universally hasten must be the highest good of all. Then she, Exceedingly do I rejoice, dear pupil. Thine eye is now fixed on the very central mark of truth. Moreover, herein is revealed that of which thou didst erstwhile profess thyself ignorant. What is that? said I. The end and the aim of the whole universe. Surely it is that which is desired of all. And, since we have concluded the good to be such, we ought to acknowledge the end and aim of the whole universe to be the good. Song 11, Reminiscence Who truth pursues, who from false ways, his heedful steps would keep, by inward light, must search within, in meditation deep. All outward bent he must repress, his soul's true treasure to possess. Then all that errors mists obscured shall shine more clear than light. This fleshly frame's oblivious weight hath quenched not reason quite. The germs of truth still lie within, whence we by learning all may win. 
Else how could ye the answer do, and taught two questions give, were it not that deep within the soul, whose secret sparks do live? If Plato's teaching erreth not, we learn but that we have forgot. End. Book 3, Reminiscence, Song 11, Section 27. The LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Anacius Manlius Severinus Boethius. Translated by H. R. James. Book 3 True Happiness and False. Section 12 and Song 12, Orpheus and Eurydice. Then said I, with all my heart, I agree with Plato. Indeed, this is now the second time that these things have been brought back to my mind. First, I lost them through the clogging contact of the body, then after, through the stress of heavy grief. Then she continued, if thou wilt reflect upon thy former admissions, it will not be long before thou dost also recollect that of which erstwhile thou didst confess thyself ignorant. What is that? said I. The principles of the world's government, said she. Yes, I remember my confession, and, although I now anticipate what thou intendest, I have a desire to hear the argument plainly set forth. A while ago thou deemst it beyond all doubt that God doth govern the world. I do not think it doubtful now, nor shall I ever, and by what reasons I am brought to this assurance I will briefly set forth. This world could never have taken shape as a single system out of parts so diverse and opposite were it not that there is one who joins together these so diverse things, and when it had once come together... The very diversity of natures would have dissevered it, and torn it asunder in universal discord, were there not one who keeps together what he has joined. Nor would the order of nature proceed so regularly, nor could its course exhibit motion so fixed in respect of position, time, range, efficacy, and character, unless there were one who, himself abiding, disposed these various vicissitudes of change. This power, whatsoever it be, whereby they remain as they were created and are kept in motion, I call by the name which all recognize, God. Then said she, Seeing that such is thy belief, it will cost me little trouble, I think, to enable thee to win happiness and return in safety to thy own country. But let us give our attention to the task that we have set before ourselves. Have we not counted independence in the category of happiness, and agreed that God is absolute happiness? Truly, we have. Then, he will need no external assistance for the ruling of the world. Otherwise, if he stands in need of aught, he will not possess complete independence. That is necessarily so, said I. Then, by his own power alone, he disposes all things. It cannot be denied. Now, God was proved to be absolute good. Yes, I, I remember. Then, he disposes all things by the agency of good, if it be true that he rules all things by his own power, whom we have agreed to be good, and he is, as it were, the rudder and helm by which the world's mechanism is kept steady and in order. Heartily do I agree, and indeed, I anticipated what thou wouldst say, though it may be in feeble surmise only. I well believe it, said she, for, as I think, thou now bringest to the search eyes quicker in discerning truth, but what I shall say next is no less plain and easy to see. What is it? said I. Why, said she, since God is rightly believed to govern all things with the rudder of goodness, and since all things do likewise, as I have taught, haste towards good by the very aim of nature, 
Can it be doubted that his governance is willingly accepted, and that all submit themselves to the sway of the disposer as conformed and attempered to his rule? Necessarily so, said I. No rule would seem happy if it were a yoke imposed on reluctant wills, and not the safekeeping of obedient subjects. There is nothing, then, which, while it follows nature, endeavors to resist good? No, nothing. But if anything should, will it have the least success against him whom we rightly agreed to be the supreme lord of happiness? It would be utterly impotent. There is nothing, then, which has either the will or the power to oppose this supreme good. No, I think not. So then, said she, it is the supreme good which rules in strength and graciously disposes all things. Then, said I, how delighted am I at thy reasonings and the conclusion to which thou hast brought them, but most of all at these very words which thou usest. I am now at last ashamed of the folly that so sorely vexed me. Thou hast heard the story of the giants assailing heaven, but a beneficent strength disposed of them also, as they deserved. But shall we submit our arguments to the shock of mutual collision? It may be, from the impact, some fair spark of truth may be struck out. If it be thy good pleasure, said I. No one can doubt that God is all-powerful. No one at all can question it who thinks consistently. Now, there is nothing which one who is all-powerful cannot do. Nothing. But can God do evil, then? Nay, by no means. Then evil is nothing, said she, since he to whom nothing is impossible is unable to do evil. Art thou mocking me, said I, weaving a labyrinth of tangled arguments, now seeming to begin where thou didst end, and now to end where thou didst begin? Or dost thou build up some wondrous circle of divine simplicity? For, truly, a little before, thou didst begin with happiness, and say it was the supreme good, and didst declare it to be seated in the supreme Godhead. God himself, too, thou didst affirm to be supreme good and all complete happiness, and from this thou didst go on to add, as, by the way, the proof that no one would be happy unless he were likewise God. Again, thou didst say that the very form of good was the essence both of God and of happiness, and didst teach that the absolute one was the absolute good which was sought by universal nature. Thou didst maintain also that God rules the universe by the governance of goodness, that all things obey him willingly, and that evil has no existence in nature. And all this thou didst unfold without the help of assumptions from without, but by inherent and proper proofs, drawing credence, one from the other. Then answered she, Far is it from me to mock thee, nay, by the blessing of God, whom we lately addressed in prayer, we have achieved the most important of all objects, for such is the form of the divine essence, that neither can it pass into things external, nor take up anything external into itself, but as Parmenides says of it, in body like to a sphere on all sides perfectly rounded, it rolls the restless orb of the universe, keeping itself motionless the while, and if I have also employed reasonings not drawn from without, but lying within the compass of our subject, there is no cause for thee to marvel, since thou hast learned on Plato's authority that words ought to be akin to the matter of which they treat. Song 12. Orpheus and Eurydice. Blessed he whose feet have stood beside the fount of good, blessed he whose will could break earth's chains for wisdom's sake. The Thracian bard, tis said, mourned his dear consort dead. To hear the plaintive strain, the woods moved in his train, 
and the stream ceased to flow, held by so soft a woe, the deer, without dismay, beside the lion lay, the hound, by songs subdued, no more the hare pursued, but the pang unassuaged, in his own bosom raged, the music that could calm all else brought him no balm, chiding the powers immortal, he came unto hell's portal. There breathed all tender things upon his sounding strings, each rhapsody high wrought his goddess mother taught, all he from grief could borrow, and love redoubling sorrow, till, as the echoes waken, all Tainarus is shaken, whilst he to Ruth persuades the monarch of the shades, with dulcet prayer, spellbound, the triple-headed hound, at sounds so strangely sweet, falls crouching at his feet. The dread avengers, too, that guilty minds pursue, with ever-haunting fears, are all dissolved in tears. Ixion, on his wheel, a respite brief doth feel, for, lo, the wheel stands still, and while those sad notes trill, Thirst-maddened Tantalus listens, oblivious of the stream's mockery and his long agony. The vulture, too, doth spare some little while to tear at Titius's rent side, sated and pacified. At length the shadowy king, his sorrows pitying, he hath prevailed, cried, we give him back his bride. To him she shall belong, as guerdon of his song. One sole condition yet upon the boon is set. Let him not turn his eyes to view his hard-won prize, till they securely pass the gates of hell. Alas, what law can lovers move? A higher law is love. For Orpheus, woe is me, on his Eurydice, day's threshold all but one looked, lost, and was undone. Ye who the light pursue, this story is for you, who seek to find a way unto the clearer day. If on the darkness past one backward look ye cast, your weak and wandering eyes have lost the matchless prize. End Book 3 True Happiness and False Section 12 and Song 12 Orpheus and Eurydice LibriVox Recording All LibriVox Recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Cory Samuel The Consolation of Philosophy By Ancius Manlius Severinus Boethius Translated by H. R. James Book 4 Good and Ill Fortune Section 1 and Song 1 The Soul's Flight Softly and sweetly Philosophy sang these verses to the end without losing aught of the dignity of her expression, or the seriousness of her tones. Then, for as much as I was yet unable to forget my deeply seated sorrow, just as she was about to say something further, I broke in and cried, O thou guide into the way of true light, all that thy voice hath uttered from the beginning, even unto now, has manifestly seemed to me at once divine contemplated in itself and, by the force of thy arguments, placed beyond the possibility of overthrow. Moreover, these truths have not been altogether unfamiliar to me heretofore, though, because of indignation at my wrongs, they have, for a time, been forgotten. But, lo, herein is the very chiefest cause of my grief, that, while there exists a good ruler of the universe, it is possible that evil should be at all, still more that it should go unpunished. Surely thou must see how deservedly this of itself provokes astonishment. But a yet greater marvel follows. While wickedness reigns and flourishes, 
virtue not only lacks its reward, but is even thrust down and trampled under the feet of the wicked, and suffers punishment in the place of crime. That this should happen under the rule of a God who knows all things, and can do all things, but wills only the good, cannot be sufficiently wondered at, nor sufficiently lamented. Then said she, It would indeed be infinitely astounding, and of all monstrous things most horrible, if, as thou esteemest, in the well-ordered home of so great a householder, the base vessels should be held in honour, the precious left to neglect. But it is not so. For if we hold unshaken those conclusions which we lately reached, thou shalt learn that, by the will of him of whose realm we are speaking, the good are always strong, the bad always weak and impotent, that vices never go unpunished, nor virtues unrewarded, that good fortune ever befalls the good, and ill fortune the bad, and much more of the sort, which shall hush thy murmurings, and establish thee in the strong assurance of conviction. And since, by my late instructions, thou hast seen the form of happiness, hast learnt, too, the seat where it is to be found, all due preliminaries being discharged, I will now show thee the road which will lead thee home. Wings, also, will I fasten to thy mind, wherewith thou mayest soar aloft, that so, all disturbing doubts removed, thou mayest return safe to thy country. Under my guidance, in the path I will show thee, and by the means which I furnish. Song 1. The Soul's Flight Wings are mine, above the pole far aloft I soar. Clothed with these, my nimble soul scorns earth's hated shore, Cleaves the skies upon the wind, Sees the clouds left far behind. Soon the glowing point she nears, Where the heavens rotate, Follows through the starry spheres Phoebus's course, or straight takes for comrade mid the stars, Saturn cold, or glittering Mars. Thus each circling orb explores through night's stole that peers, then, when all unnumbered, soars far beyond the spheres, mounting heaven's supremest height to the very fount of light. There, the sovereign of the world, his calm sway maintains, as the globe is onward whirled, guides the chariot reins, and in splendour glittering reigns the universal king. Hither, if thy wandering feet find at last a way, here thy long-lost home thou'lt greet, dear lost land thou'lt say, though from thee I've wandered wide, hence I came, here will abide. Yet, if ever thou art fain, visitant to be of earth's gloomy night again, surely thou wilt see, tyrants, whom the nations fear, dwell in hapless exile here. End of Book Four Good and Ill Fortune Section One and Song One The Soul's Flight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. Translated by H. R. James. Book 4. Good and Ill Fortune. Section 2 and Song 2. The Bondage of Passion. Then said I, Verily, wondrous great are thy promises, yet I do not doubt, but thou canst make them good. Only keep me not in suspense after raising such hopes. Learn then first, said she, how that power ever waits upon the good, while the bad are left wholly destitute of strength. The one proves the other, for since good and evil are contraries, 
if it is made plain that good is power, the feebleness of evil is clearly seen, and, conversely, if the frail nature of evil is made manifest, the strength of good is thereby known. However, to win ampler credence for my conclusion, I will pursue both paths, and draw confirmation for my statements, first in one way, and then in the other. The carrying out of any human action depends upon two things, to wit, will and power. If either be wanting, nothing can be accomplished. For if the will be lacking, no attempt is made to do what is not willed. Whereas, if there be no power, the will is all in vain. And so, if thou seest any man wishing to attain some end, yet utterly failing to attain it, thou canst not doubt that he lacked the power of getting what he wished for. Why, certainly not, there is no denying it. Canst thou, then, doubt that he whom thou seest to have accomplished what he willed, had also the power of accomplishing it? Of course not. Then, in respect of what he can accomplish, a man is to be reckoned strong, in respect of what he cannot accomplish, weak. Granted, said I. Then, dost thou remember that, by our former reasonings, it was concluded that the whole aim of man's will, though the means of pursuit vary, is set intently upon happiness? I do remember that this, too, was proved. Dost thou also call to mind how happiness is absolute good, and therefore that, when happiness is sought, it is good which is in all cases the object of desire? Nay, I do not so much call to mind as keep it fixed in my memory. Then all men, good and bad alike, with one indistinguishable purpose, strive to reach good. Yes, that follows. But it is certain that by the attainment of good, men become good? It is. Then, do the good attain their object? It seems so. But, if the bad were to attain the good, which is their object, they could not be bad. No. Then both seek good, but while the one sort attains it, the other attain it not. Is there any doubt that the good are endued with power, while they who are bad are weak? If any doubt it, he is incapable of reflecting on the nature of things, or the consequences involved in reasoning. Again, supposing that there are two things in which the same function is prescribed in the course of nature, and one of these successfully accomplishes the function by natural action, the other is altogether incapable of that natural action, instead of which, in a way other than is agreeable to its nature, it, I will not say fulfills its function, but feigns to fulfill it. Which of these two would, in thy view, be the stronger? I guess thy meaning, but I pray thee, let me hear it more at large. Walking is man's natural motion, is it not? Certainly. Thou dost not doubt, I suppose, that it is natural for the feet to discharge this function. No, surely I do not. Now, if one man who is able to use his feet walks, and another, to whom the natural use of his feet is wanting, tries to walk on his hands, which of the two wouldst thou rightly esteem the stronger? Go on, said I. No one can question, but that he who has the natural capacity has more strength than he who has it not. Now the supreme good is set up as the end alike for the bad and for the good. But the good seek it through the natural action of the virtues, whereas the bad try to attain the same good through all manner of concupiscence which is not the natural way of attaining good. Or, dost thou think otherwise? Nay, rather one further consequence is clear to me, for from my admission it must needs follow that the good have power and the bad are impotent. Thou anticipatest rightly, and that, as physicians reckon, is a sign that nature is set working, and thou throwest off the disease. But, since I see thee so ready at understanding, I will heap proof on proof. Look how manifest is the extremity of vicious man's weakness. They cannot even reach the goal to which the aim of nature leads, and almost constrains them. What if they were left without this mighty, this well-nigh irresistible, help of nature's guidance? Consider also how momentous is the powerlessness which incapacitates the wicked. Not light or trivial are the prizes which they contend for, but which they cannot win or hold. Nay, their failure concerns the very sum and crown of things. Poor wretches, they fail to compass even that for which they toil day and night. 
Herein also the strength of the good conspicuously appears. For just as thou wouldst judge him to be the strongest walker, whose legs could carry him to a point beyond which no further advance was possible, so must thou needs account him stronger in power, who so attains the end of his desire, that nothing further to be desired lies beyond. Whence follows the obvious conclusion that they who are wicked are seen likewise to be wholly destitute of strength. For why do they forsake virtue and follow vice? Is it from ignorance of what is good? Well, what is more weak and feeble than the blindness of ignorance? Do they know what they ought to follow, but lust drives them aside out of the way? If it be so, they are still frail by reason of their incontinence, for they cannot fight against vice. Or do they, knowingly and willfully, forsake the good and turn aside to vice? Why, at this rate, they not only cease to have power, but cease to be at all. For they who forsake the common end of all things that are, they likewise cease to be at all. Now to some it may appear strange that we should assert that the bad, who form the greater part of mankind, do not exist. But the fact is so. I do not, indeed, deny that they who are bad are bad, but that they are in an unqualified and absolute sense I deny. Just as we can call a corpse a dead man, but cannot call him simply a man, so I would allow the vicious to be bad, but that they are in an absolute sense I cannot allow. That only is which maintains its place and keeps its nature. For whatever falls away from this forsakes the existence which is essential to its nature. But, thou will say, the bad have an ability, nor do I wish to deny it. Only this ability of theirs comes not from strength, but from impotence. For their ability is to do evil, which would have had no efficacy at all if they could have continued in the performance of good. So, this ability of theirs proves them still more plainly to have no power. For if, as we concluded just now, evil is nothing, tis clear that the wicked can effect nothing, since they are only able to do evil. Tis evident. And, that thou mayest understand what is the precise force of this power, we determined, did we not, a while back, that nothing has more power than supreme good. We did, said I. But that same highest good cannot do evil. Certainly not. Is there any one, then, who thinks that men are able to do all things? None but a madman. Yet they are able to do evil. I would they could not. Since then, he who can do only good is omnipotent, while they who can do evil are not omnipotent. It is manifest that they who can do evil have less power. There is this also. We have shown that all power is to be reckoned among things desirable, and that all desirable things are referred to good as to a kind of consummation of their nature. But the ability to commit crime cannot be referred to the good. Therefore it is not a thing to be desired. And yet all power is desirable. It is clear, then, that ability to do evil is not power. From all which considerations appeareth the power of the good, and the indubitable weakness of the bad. It is clear that Plato's judgment was true. The wise alone are able to do what they would, while the wicked follow their own heart's lust, but cannot accomplish what they would. For they go on in their willfulness, fancying they will attain what they wish for in the paths of delight. But they are very far from its attainment, since shameful deeds lead not to happiness. Song 2. The Bondage of Passion When high enthroned the monarch sits, resplendent in his pride, Of purple robes while flashing steel guards him on every side, When baleful terrors on his brow with frowning menace lower, And passion shakes his laboring breast, how dreadful seems his power! But if the vestiture of his state from such a one thou tear, Thou wilt see the load of secret bonds this lord of earth doth wear. Lust's poison rankles, over his mind rage sweeps in tempest rude. Sorrow his spirit vexes sore, and empty hopes delude. Then thou wilt confess, one hapless wretch, who many lords oppress, Does never what he would, but lives in thraldom's helplessness. End of Book 4 Good Fortune and Ill Section 2 and Song 2 The Bondage of Passion